And in this case, for example, we're looking at a, a slaving castle in, the, in West Africa. And the advantage of digitizing it, which Tom made clear to me with his gallery space, was if you digitize it at a fine enough resolution, like 600 dots per inch, you can start to look at things in detail. And I'll show you a bit of this just as an example. This is a slaving castle, which is under British control by 1753 in, um, in West Africa. In fact, it's based on a diagram that was made in 1727. So they were in control of it for quite a while. But you can look at the different compartments in the floor plan on one level. But far more interesting um, for the work that a lot of African historians are doing now is the insert in the upper right hand corner, which is a map. Mm. And it shows you the location of the castle under the uh, designation of A, <laughs> A, the castle, uh, in reference to Cape Coast Gardens. Now, when you think of it, this is something that is absolutely <laughs> crucial to study, but nobody's done it. And you can figure out why they haven't done it um, fairly quickly as well. That is, it took a lot of food to feed millions of people traveling thousands of miles over hundreds of years. But nobody's asked the question, who provided the food? In other words, nobody's looked at the prior plantations that had to have existed in Africa in order to fuel and feed the transatlantic trade. Now it's fairly clear why you wouldn't find that because those engaged in the trade jealously guarded their food sources as a matter of trade secrets. They didn't go splashing this stuff around. They didn't want their competitors to know how they were doing it. Um, and then those who were involved in the production in local villages had no particular interest, especially after the slave trade, in revealing what their role had been in the food supply for the slave trade itself. Now, it gets fairly uh, interesting fairly fast when you begin to realize that these old diagrams are embedded within fort plans for the most part. And what we've started to do in a group called the Africa Map Circle is look systematically at some of these old diagrams. Let me show you what I mean by example. Um, there is a, a group that is online uh, that's called the Africa Map Circle. And anybody can log on to it. And we're in fact encouraging more and more American historians as well as African historians to get access to it. Um, and we've made some resources available for them to explore. <laughs> as I was mentioning earlier, once you give students the tools to explore something, uh, you got to get out of the way because they, they are so interested and so um, motivated to look at collections like the Library of Congress map collections relating to Africa, those of the New York Public Library related to Africa, those of the Stanford University Libraries related to Africa. So all of these things are just portals into their collections. Um, and the maps of Africa from the Illinois Library, Northwestern University Library. These are the centers that have strong African studies programs. Uh, the Yale University a library, for example, has a fantastic maps that um, we weren't able to share, didn't even know existed before we started teaching digitally. Mm -hmm. But in the COVID moment, we've come to teach digitally and learn how to teach digitally. And uh, Tom Paris papers uh, uh, examples here have given us an inspiration of how to proceed because you can look at an atlas like this which of course you'd never get access to as a normal researcher. In the 50 years I've been doing research on African history, I've never give, been given access to an atlas that is this rare and <laughs> ensconced in so many layers of permission that you can't possibly work, hope to work with it in paper. Even if you got access to it, you couldn't lean over it and get up close enough to it to make it mean much. But if it's digitized at 600 dots per inch, 
you can see Africa from a whole new point of view, especially in this case, since they draw it upside down, uh, which is the, you know, the classic European, Euro, Eurocentric vision of Africa at the time, we're, we're looking at it from across the Mediterranean, as it were. <laughs> and just by way of illustrating to, to Af African historians and Africans, how their own continent has been portrayed, it's fascinating subject matter, which we shared in a meeting last month uh, with the University of Ghana. But this is only one of the collections, as I say, and perhaps the, the richest collection uh, exists in Afroterra. I don't know if any of you know about Afroterra, but it's an extraordinary uh, collection. And its first map that it shows you is this kind of thing. They give you the map details and the like, but they organize themselves as the free, you can see up in the upper left-hand corner, it's the cartographic free library on Africa that can be used by anyone in the world. And the <coughs> real extraordinary feature of this was put together by the owner of the collection. It's a private collection, mm. um, a fellow named uh, Gerald Rizzo. He's, he's a doctor, but he's a, he's a, he's a kidney doctor <laughs> in, <laughs> in St. Petersburg, uh, uh, Florida. That is, I've um, only seen him three or four times, but we've corresponded voluminously because of the richness of his collection. One of which you can see very quickly here, he's invented and devised a system for scanning these maps. It's very, very interesting. And this is a map uh, which you can see north is indicated to the left, not a convention that we follow any longer, but the Dutch did at the time. And you can see very quickly and probably identify for uh, your own purposes, what the subject matter here is. This in fact is Robin Island in the center of a bay on a Dutch map, which is the Cape Town, South Africa Bay. Now, for those of us interested in the millions of people transported thousands of miles over hundreds of years, what was of equal interest to the prison system that was developed in the islands off the coast was, as we zoomed in on this, the gardens. The gardens again, in relation to a fort. And the buildings represented in the pink, the gardens that are the government gardens, but then also the gardens off to the side in the southwest or the, the lower left corner here, the private gardens. And of course, with the Dutch flag on it here, this is a Dutch company and the British often referred to um, the South Africa as a, a cabbage patch on the way to India. Their particular interest in South Africa was not the territory itself, but the fact that it was a provisioning station on the way to their real empire, uh, that is the, the Indian empire. 